Hello, good peoples of the internet. Today I have Michelle Lisa with me. Welcome to the show, Michelle. Thanks for having me. So please tell our audience, what is it that you do? I've led uh, a number of teams, mainly creative teams for a number of years and coaching, development, finding their potential. Okay, creative teams, coaching, development. So what did you do for these creative teams? How did you help them grow? So I think in leading a team, for me, one of the very valuable skills is being able to be empathetic. I think sometimes we forget that leadership means really putting your heart into it. I've always led very creative teams with some background of not having that sort of corporate background and being able to understand their creative side while bridging the gap with the corporate side as well and understanding that on that particular side, there is a need to meet goals and how do I then bridge that gap? So I've always thought of leadership in the space of being empathetic. I've always led with putting myself in other people's shoes and also with respect. I think that leadership really involves like being respectful, being accountable. I too would also be accountable for my team's work. And when I say empathy, I feel that we have to lead with heart. We cannot just lead by a list of to-dos. You have to understand your team and where they're coming from. I couldn't agree with you more. I'm a big advocate of empathy as well, especially when we talk about a corporate environment. I think it's very important to understand that everybody has an agenda, but when we communicate to each other, we're talking to another human being, right? And that person has feelings, that person has their own thoughts, their own life happening as well. And we need to take that into consideration. My next question would be, when you integrate empathy into these teams, how do you do that? I think listening is key. Taking the time to really not just listen, but hear the people that you're leading. I've always created space or time, whether that be in weekly one-on-ones or if someone raises their hand and said, I really need to talk to you, it's really finding that time in the day to listen and hear them and understanding their perspective. Hearing and listening is a big part of coaching, as I understand. So there is something in coaching called deep listening. What is deep listening? I think deep listening is being able to sit with the information. And sometimes we may not have an immediate answer, but having that ability to walk away and be reflective in our thinking. And sometimes we may not immediately have, like I said, the answers, but we can then say, you know what? I don't have the answers to give to you in the immediate moment. Let me get back to you. I think that being authentic, understanding where the person is coming from, it all involves like attentive listening. Absolutely. So. Attentive listening is one part of integrating empathy in a corporate environment. So what would be the other side of it from the employee side? So when they express their thoughts and ideas to their manager and what would need to happen on their side? I think there has to be an understanding as well that maybe we won't find the answers. Maybe they may have to go back and come up with resolutions themselves. Maybe we'll have to explore it together. And maybe the answer is a simple no. I think that when someone comes to you, they also have to be open to what the end result can be. Sure. Uh, can you give us a specific example? Let's say their job requires 50% of travel. And, and they're like, you know what? I no longer want to travel. I see myself 
working here in the office 100% of the time. I think, yes, we can be open to listening and maybe creating a career path that shifts. But in the moment, if that particular person is needed, then that we should be able to say then your skills are needed at this moment, or I do not have the answer for you if you don't have a position for them. And um, just being very honest and authentic or maybe this isn't the right position for you, you may have to reconsider. I think being honest and being authentic is also a part of leading with empathy. That was a great example that you mentioned there. So what I was hearing that this person had a need to transition from traveling to being full-time in the office and the company may not have had the resources or they not have had the opportunity they actually needed on the business, the business needed that person to be on the road. And that created a disparity. Now, what would be the best way to negotiate this situation and find common ground or a long-term solution maybe? I think first is understanding the reasons why this particular person is opting to make that shift. Sometimes we can become a bit emotional. We all do. It's the human condition. Maybe their workload is so much that they feel overwhelmed in the moment. Maybe they've had a life change event that I'm unaware of. Or maybe the job is no longer fulfilling their potential. And I think it's really exploring that to really understand the rationale behind it. So in the interim, firstly, it's really establishing the reasons why this person is making that shift and understanding it. And then, as I said, in the moment, just really pondering on that information, not jump into quick decisions, maybe because you want to hold an employee on or keep an employee, quickly say, okay, I'm going to make changes. You have to follow through. So in the moment, really being open. And if you need a day or two to process and get back to the individual, that's what you do to create a plan. But I say listening and then following up, creating a plan. And if that plan entails maybe a couple of months shifting to a new position or simply saying, unfortunately, we don't have that position now, you may then have to make that decision as to whether or not this position works. Always being helpful, always being supportive. If the employee is overwhelmed, regular check-ins, ensuring that they get that support they need. I love the intention there to strive for a constructive solution, whatever happens, and just having this discussion. When managers and business owners have so much going on in their daily lives and their focus is so divided across the different divisions of the business and everything that's happening across all the divisions, how can they disconnect to that and connect with their employees to hear them out and to have these conversations? I think scheduling time with your employees, whether that be weekly, one-on-ones, even 15 minutes, it's really important that this time becomes a priority. Also, this time does not belong to us as a manager. This time belongs to the person that you're leading. So it's really important that you prioritize this time and ensure that your calendars are free and you are 100% in the moment, listening attentively. In addition to that, you want to ensure that you schedule time to follow up if there's a need to follow up or to engage So it's really important you find that time and that time needs to be completely devoted to listening and being open and following up. Thank you for that. And for the employees, when we talk about the employees, let's say they aspiring for a higher position, but the company may not have one available for them at that moment in time. What would be the wise course of action or your advice how to deal with that or negotiate their way through that situation? I think honesty is key. 
no one wants to be told, yes, it's happening and it never happens. And you continuously bring this up in, let's say, your one-on-one and nothing's happening. And I also think it breaks the trust. If there isn't a position that's available, you should be on about sharing this with your employee. However, I think it's an opportunity for that particular worker to be better at what they're currently doing. In addition to that, what I've done in situations like that, so maybe there isn't something on our team that the employee may have in the immediate moment, but an exploration on another team might be an option. Maybe let's say you're in education and there's nothing available. Maybe you explore something in PR or or whatever else. But in the interim, I think that not taking it off the table, exploring these options and ensuring that wherever they are, you continue to develop the skills that they need to take them to the next level. Thank you. I'm getting goosebumps just listening to you. It's fascinating. And I just want to say to our audience that this interview has not been scripted. Michelle, I think you can confirm, right? You haven't received any questions up front. And just listening to you uh, right away with this in-depth answer, you're so knowledgeable. How long have you been doing this for? Without aging myself, I've been, uh, it's been a process and I think leading people is the hardest thing and I'm still learning. It's been over 10 years and I'm learning. And like I said, I think a lot of it comes from me being able to put myself in the other person's position. And I think that's where the empathy comes in. So a lot of times, because we all face some of the same challenges in work, in our daily lives. So once you do that, you create an understanding of all sides. And you have the ability as well to look at what I say, all sides of the beach ball when you're empathetic. And where, where did this come from? Like for you, when you decided to pursue a career in developing leaders with empathy and integrating empathy at the workplace, where, where do you get the motivation from? So I had been leading teams for quite some time and I found my sweet spot in really mentoring people. And what I felt really resonated is empathy. I felt that when you truly are authentically connecting with someone and hearing them out, that people feel understood they feel safe to express their frustrations. They feel a sense of support as well. And so it's always been my greatest skill is in really using empathy to mentor. What skills did you need to learn in order to help the leaders become better? I think listening skills are important and listening attentively. I always say listening, not just listening, but hearing what the person's saying. I think communication, being clear is really important. Brene Brown says she talks about being clear and being clear is kind and unclear is unkind. So it's important that you are a good communicator, you have clarity, you're an attentive listener, and you lead with heart. And also, I think another piece to it is also having accountability as a leader, knowing that you are accountable for everyone. Ultimately, you are accountable for your employees' results. Having that understanding as well is is very important. And how can leaders learn to listen better and to understand better, to really hear their employees? What can they do to improve on these skills? I think time. Time is our most valuable commodity. And scheduling time for someone can mean so much. And being in the moment, not just scheduling time and being on your phone or being interrupted by an email, 10 minutes of undivided 
time listening will make a difference. And I think it just starts with that. It starts with that. Listening, scheduling time for someone else to be heard. So what is the most common problem of your clients when they approach you? They're not being heard. There's no follow up or follow through consistency. There's always a huge gap in consistency. Maybe you have a conversation, you're upset, and then your manager says, well, schedule time to talk every week. And this occurs for a month. And then things changes because we all get busy. But I think having that consistency, following up and following through, if you're not able to meet an obligation, being very clear about it, I think those things are so important as simplistically as they may seem. So when your clients come to you with these problems, how do you help them? Start with understanding each employee, their strengths, how do they play into the team. And I think when you understand their strengths, you can help leverage that in the scope of a team. How do you help your clients when they come to you with these problems that they're not being heard, their employers are not consistent with their promises, and their inquiries are not being followed up? So that's what you said, that these are the typical problems of your clients. So when they come to you with these problems, how do you help? So my first thing is making sure that, again, scheduling time for your employees to be heard, understanding your team's strengths and weaknesses and how you can leverage those. Also, consistency is a big thing, whether that be weekly one-on-ones or ensuring there are team meetings. I think participation is another really important piece because every employee should be heard and we should be lead from every seat, regardless of where we are in terms of upward mobility. And having your team be a part of those meetings is a way to start incorporating some of those things. Well, thank you for sharing that. So what would you recommend that people can start doing even today to move the needle just that little bit? I think the biggest one is finding time to listen to your employee, just saying whether it be 10 minutes that you schedule, even if that's once per month and you check in what's going on, you say, what's going on. I think that's the biggest thing. We all want to feel like someone's listening. We all want to feel supported. And I think that's the biggest thing when your boss says, I'm going to schedule time to hear you. 10 minutes, come into my office. What's going on? What's the most important thing you want to talk about today? I think that's key. Yeah, well, that sounds really powerful, actually. I understand how that would be very meaningful if I was working for a company that would be super important or it would make me feel really good if actually somebody demonstrated genuine interest. Obviously, I went into entrepreneurship because I didn't fit in well with the corporate world and it runs in the family as well. That's what I've seen from my parents, so I followed on with this. But I work with other business owners and entrepreneurs and I see how these work. And often the employees end up complaining to people outside the organization about what happens inside because these discussions are not happening within the company, right? I truly feel that we can lead from every seat. It doesn't matter where you are on the corporate ladder. Everyone has a say and their perspective should matter. Even in meetings, I think it's also important for people, whether you create that sort of a round table atmosphere where there is some participation by every person, whether it be 10 minutes. And this doesn't have to occur monthly. It can be every six months and you share your agenda ahead of time and let each person actually have an opportunity to share. I think that's really important. For me, I 
had a number of people all across the United States. And whenever we came together, it was very important for me to have them share in our meetings, to have them give their feedback, to have them truly be a part of it. And you don't have to be at a particular level to share. And sometimes the best things come from those people who are at varying levels. Yes, exactly. I know that, for instance, in the UK, they specifically hire people from different educational backgrounds as well, because highly educated people work in a very homogeneous framework, and people who might have not had the same education can bring different perspectives to the table, and that can create innovation and innovative solutions. So they really advocate hiring people from different backgrounds and from different education levels just to create the diversification and so that they're more in touch with the society as well, which is equally diverse, if not more. I couldn't agree more. And that's when I say leveraging your strengths, that's how I see it as well, because the whole concept of being well-rounded isn't really true. We can never all be well-rounded. I don't think it exists. I think we all have strengths that we can leverage. And of course, we all have weaknesses that we can work on. And so when we use our natural talents, we become better at what we do. And as a manager or team leader, I think it's important for you to understand each person on the team's strength, what they can bring to the table. And so, like you said, in the UK, there's this dynamic of hiring different people. If you're on a team as well, really keying into what is this one person good at? So maybe you're working on a team project. And if I'm good at research, then you leverage that strength. And I, I think that's really important for building successful teams. And like I said, we all have things that we need to work on. It doesn't mean that we don't continue to work on the things that we're not good at. But oftentimes we find ourselves really putting in the energy into the things that we're not good at and the things that we're naturally talented at, we lose those. We mm. don't focus on those. It's that it's growing up. If you are good at math and all of the other subjects, your parents are like fine. And the moment you're not good at one thing, all of the emphasis is placed on that one thing that you're not good at rather than leveraging the strengths that you have, really building those. Because when we're naturally talented at something, the sky's the limit. Yes, absolutely. And it's really important to know your strengths and build on that. So how can employers understand what are the individual strengths or their employees? There are a lot of actually training programs that incorporates like really highlighting your strengths. And sometimes we don't know, we can even ask someone, an employee, like, what do you feel you're good at? Oftentimes, someone may have a hobby that we're so unaware of, and that hobby may include like research, as I said, but they're not doing it in the scope of the job. And so really finding out from them or hiring someone to really come in and assess your skill set and what you're good at. And once that is actually done, then really leveraging those or helping to build on those when it comes to being a part of the team. And do you help companies with this? Like when you come into a company as a coach, would you help them to identify the strength of their employees? You have your own methodologies and how to work on these and how to discover these? Absolutely. And I think that's it's so important for motivation and inspiration as well. And so I would identify different programs or different skill sets that can actually help to identify the skill sets or the natural talents of people on the team. Or if you've been working with someone, I think, and you take the time to understand them, you quickly see where their talents lie and you can work with them to enhance that and to grow that skill set. 
Yes, I, I recently heard this from someone else as well, actually, that this working along or shadowing someone, working together with someone really helps you to learn a lot about the other person, their methods, their ways of working, and often is the best way to understand how another person is operating. I agree. I agree. It's We go to college or university and we learn all of these things, but sometimes what really matters is the hands-on work. It's the environments that we're in. Nothing can prepare you for the live performance. That's exactly true. They, it's like you can't learn to drive from a book. It's a bit of a cliche, but it's so true, right? So when real life happens, everything is very different. Absolutely. Okay, so I also understand that you recently went back to school to embrace psychology at a deeper level. Yes, I found my sweet spot in really mentoring people and I wanted to do it in a greater way. And I think a bigger way is really understanding on a deeper level how people work and function. And so for me, it was very important to go back to school and build that skills. We're always learning and I think we'll continue to learn until, well, at least I'll speak for myself, until the day I die. And I really wanted to have a deeper understanding of how teams function, and also I wanted data to support that as well. And so I've decided to take this journey and build my skill set and get another degree and new perspective that can be incorporated into what I've already done in the corporate setting and hopefully merge those two. It's an exciting time and I'm learning so much. Sounds like it, Michelle. It sounds like it's a very exciting time. So are you looking to get into more the organizational psychology of things? Yes, that's one of the things that I, I would like to do is to bridge that gap. I think it's so important to have an understanding of, as I mentioned before, all sides of the beach ball. The complexity of mental health and being, the understanding of what we face in our daily lives, and how do we make that work in a corporate setting. So I'd like to leverage my experience working with teams and understanding the goals and what the company needs to be successful, but also bridging that with the human side of it and how can we motivate and get that person to meet their goals and their expectations while remaining exciting and motivated. It's so very important to stay motivated as well and to understand what drives you because otherwise it just becomes a chore, whatever you do, right? If you don't know why you're doing it. Some people find solace in repetition. I do know people who actually find security and stability in repeatedly doing the same thing. And that's just very fulfilling for them that they have that consistency in their lives. On the other hand, I think most people just find it mundane if they keep doing the same thing over and over again without knowing where they're going with it or why actually they are doing it. Is it just to pay the bills or is there like a greater agenda behind it? Yeah, and, and that's a big thing. And, and that's where I think inspiration comes in. How do we inspire our employees? For me, one of the things that I've done in leadership trainings is incorporate some sort of development piece, but something that also inspires them. So that's something you can do with your team. If you're having, let's say, your annual sales meeting, maybe you put aside an hour for some sort of like team building that is also linked to development and inspiration. But I think inspiration is really key in keeping an employee motivated. Without sharing any names or any details, of course, for professional reasons, what's the greatest transformation you have witnessed in your career? 
I think that we're in a space where many people don't see we've transitioned from being in the office full time to working at home. And I think that a hybrid model for me is the best case scenario because we've transitioned from this space where we no longer have that human connection or where we no longer create these opportunities to look at someone in the office or the office over that we aspire to be. And we risk losing using those mentorships and those opportunities even for making shifts in our career. We may be in one department and see the functioning of a different department and being in the office to understand and see it in person. May You may say, you know what, this is where I want to grow. This is where I want to go. So that piece, I think it's that mentorship and that human connection that exists in the office. I feel like we're missing out on a big piece of it when we're so, to some degree, siloed. And this cannot be done online. So I think that shift in being our solo leaders per se, because we've become so disconnected from that human connection. I couldn't agree with you more. And even as an entrepreneur, when you spend too much time alone, then you're not learning from others, right? Because it's not just the human connection. It's not just the chit chat and the conversations, but also pick up things from others. They open your mind up to different perspectives. They, you know, provide input. And sometimes you learn techniques, you learn skills, you grow together, right? So when you isolate yourself, it has maybe financial advantages. You save money on commuting and you can have lunch at home and whatever. But on the other hand, you're losing a big time on learning and growing professionally. Absolutely. And another big piece of it as well is, and I must say in full transparency, I did not do it as well as I should have in my younger career. You miss out on the opportunity to network as well. I think it's so key in whatever we do. It's also important to connect with other people, like-minded people in your industry or in your groups, along with learning and understanding, you miss huge opportunities to connect as well. Yeah, networking is a big one. I'm a big fan of it. I'm a big networker myself. I absolutely love it. Both on social media, I do it on, online as well. And in real life, I go to all kind of networking meetups and events and conferences because I, I just love the buzz and the interaction that's mm -hmm. happening. That I think it's great. And really, you hear so many things. People think they can find this information online. And there is a lot of good and valuable information out there on YouTube, even on Instagram. If you follow the right pages, there, there are people who are sharing legitimate good advice in whatever area of your life is your focus. But some of the secrets that are dropped in these in-person meetups in the network and in these conversations, that they can really make a huge difference in someone's life. Yes, I feel like the human connection, the human one-on-one -on -one will always be key. That no machines, no connecting only through social media can ever take the place with an honest interaction. So that's why it's so important to connect to find that one mentor in the office so it's so important it's interesting to interesting that you say that social media can never replace that and i believe that this is what they're trying to solve with the metaverse that's why there was so much hype and buzz around it because that kind of brings people to get or is supposed to bring people together without actually physically bringing them together what's your take on that it's almost like paint by numbers, right? There is no individuality. There isn't because the scope is so wide. So while I think that it's important that social media connects us and it's very important, of course, nowadays, most companies are global and you can understand a consumer in another country. 
I really think that we should use it to our advantage, but not completely rely on it, meaning that we still have to connect on a human level. We still have to meet in the office, whether it be a day or two, and have face-to-face interactions, see people's emotions and hear them, not just via Zoom, which is, like I said, it's, it's important and it's convenient, but we cannot let that be the say it all or the do it all. We should use it to our advantage in our work, but don't have it completely replace our interactions with others. So you don't see people wearing VRs in their houses and meeting in virtual spaces, replacing the real human connection in the foreseeable future? It's connection. Nowadays, it's unfortunate, but we're dealing with so much loneliness. We are so connected, yet loneliness is becoming an issue. And it's the most connected that we've ever been in the world. We're so in, we're siloed, we're in our little areas, we're in our little boxes. And I think also when we're we are in our boxes as well, it does not lend itself to creative thinking, to being open. And we see the results when we don't understand each other because we're in this little box that we create. Yeah, actually, that was one of my biggest concerns during the lockdowns. I'm a father. I have a 12-year-old son that he didn't go to school. My biggest concern was that he's missing out on all the social interactions and that his social skills won't be developing like how our social skills develop. What's going to happen to these kids who had to sit home for those two years and not go to school and like learn over Zoom and whatever? How are they going to be affected by not having those social interactions? And then one day after COVID, I took him to a summer camp. And then the camp leader, they, he told us that the kids on the breaks, they went and picked up their phones and they spent the entire break on their phones without talking to each other. And then when the break was up, they put the phones away, went back into the camp, continued with the activities. And this goes to how we socialize our children. And I think in everything that we do, there should be balance. I think it's important that we connect and they connect with their friends and they use their devices. But I also feel that there should be time where human interaction is encouraged, socialization is encouraged. Because that is a key part of development. And when our phones are not here or we don't have the use of technology, we should still be able to be in the moment with our friends and families. So again, I think balance is key. And so we, as I'm not a parent, but I would say we should encourage children to create balance and create space as well and have time for play with other people. And how do you think these lack of social interactions are affecting the development of empathy in people? I think when we are in our own boxes, we don't foster understanding. When you don't interact with someone else or you don't understand their perspective and your perspective is all that you know, then it's very easy for you to judge someone else or for you to think that your values are the most important. And it's harder for you to understand the particular situation when things go wrong. So I think that when you lock yourself away and you only listen to one perspective, you don't grow. You're siloed and it doesn't make for compassion, for understanding someone else's circumstances. So I think it's important that we see different perspectives and understand each other's stories. We may not agree with someone else's story, but I think knowing and understanding helps to aid empathy. And empathy doesn't mean that you have to have gone through that particular challenge. 
it's just putting yourself in that person's perspective, in that person's mindset, just understanding. You don't have to agree, but just understanding. So it's been 15 years now since smartphones been around and I think the social media and our dependency or our addiction to the phone has grown exponentially as a species. What would you recommend people to maintain this sensitivity towards others? What can they do to not become desensitized? I think also scheduling time, social time is so important as well. We talk about time, but yeah, scheduling time, whether that be with a family member, taking a walk, going outside. I think scheduling social time is key. Being involved in different group membership, a sport, an organization, but not becoming so completely enveloped in just the phones, what on social media, but getting out there and even doing things like volunteering is so important. I think that would help. Yes, it's very interesting that you say that because when I think about it, actually on social media, what happens that based on your preferences and what you like to listen to, they serve you more of the same content. So you said you become boxed into your own ideas and you don't really get the perspective from outside of that. I agree. And I was having a conversation with someone recently. We talk a lot about evidence and having done the research. And sometimes I feel like nowadays you can find anything to support your perspective. If you have a certain belief, you can find anything to support that. And I, I think that it's okay not to share the same perspective as someone else, but you should be open to learning and to having a different perspective. Because oftentimes we go on these bandwagons is what I, what I call yeah. them without even knowing why, or mm. without rationale, without even understanding our position. And I think it's so important if we're going to have a position in anything, or if we're going to have a say, I think it's fundamentally important for you to be able to defend that position and mm -hmm. defend it from a place of knowledge. So I think that is key. It's really having the background and the knowledge to really, because sometimes we say, oh, yes, I, I am this way or that way. And then you ask, why? Can you share with me why? And we sometimes don't know. And I think when we don't know, it's an opportunity to say, okay, why do I feel that way? Why do I believe this? And like I said, just being able to defending your perspective is also important. It's the responsible thing to do. You cannot take a position without knowing what it is and without being able to defend it. Yeah, I think a lot of the elite schools, they have classes in debate where you're actually given an argument and two individuals or teams are chosen to defend either side of the argument. And sometimes you have to defend arguments, like the position that you don't agree with or you don't believe in, just for the sake of learning the debate. And I think it's very enlightening, especially if you have to argue for something that you don't agree with, just out of principle, just practicing that and embracing a different perspective momentarily, just to see what's it like or where that might come from. Exactly. And I think it all has to be done in a respectful way, of course. And the basis of it is understanding. That's all. It's knowledge and understanding. And you may explore a subject matter and come back and say, I still have these feelings and that's okay. But you should be open to other people's perspective. You should be open to saying, you know what? I don't agree with you. However, I respect your position. And I think that's where healthy debates come in. It's why sometimes, like considering now what's happening in the world, we become so emotionally driven that we lead with this emotion sometimes. And that's okay because it's the human condition. But when we take a position and it's not right or it's not serving us, we should also be accountable and responsible and 
show up and say, you know what, I didn't do the background work that I needed to do, or this is my position, but all being done in a respectful way. It should not be finger pointing. It's fostering understanding. Things may seem very cliche because of how we use simple words like, oh, it's all about love, it's compassion, it's empathy. At the end of the day, a lot of it is. A lot of it really comes down to it. And sometimes when you understand what someone else's position is, you realize that, wait a minute, we're saying the same things. A lot of times that's key. So this is why debate, sharing different perspectives are so important. Yes, a wise man once told me that everybody wants to feel secure and everybody wants to be appreciated. And that's so true. I think when you consider all the different perspectives and you boil it down underneath it all, everybody just wants to feel safe and they want to be appreciated. I agree. Every person, I'll speak for myself, wants to be validated. That's it. You don't have to agree with someone else's position. But if you validate them, I think it changes the trajectory of the conversation. By validating, meaning even if you don't agree with someone, how would you validate their Oh, like you said, okay, I I appreciate like where you're coming from, even if you don't agree, or what do you mean? You simply say, I hear you. I hear you. Hmm. That's all we need to do. I hear you. I hear what you're saying. I think that's validation. We just need to be heard. Thank you for sharing that, Michelle. Now with that, if somebody would like to work with you and hire you to help with the organizational cultural change or integrating empathy in their organizational culture or in their leadership style, where can they find you? They can find my information on LinkedIn and it's all there. Thank you for joining us today and for sharing all your insights about how to lead with empathy and how people can become more empathetic towards each other. Thank you for that. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks a lot too. So if you like Michelle's advice and you would like to learn more about coaching and how to develop personally as well as professionally, if you're interested to learn more about coaching, please subscribe to our channel and follow us. With that, thank you for joining us for today's interview as well and see you on the next one. Bye-bye.